Um, tonight, we are continuing our step-by-step series. Um, remember, our, our goal with step-by-step is to become more familiar with the Bible, with each book of the Bible, so that we can become better students of the Bible. And our approach is not to try to go through and exposit each passage within a book, but rather to kind of look at the backstory and the structure and the layout of a book to maybe address some of the challenges that are in a book so that on your own, you can read through the book and you can exposit the book well. So we're trying to to help put the tools into your hands so that you can study the books more carefully on your own. And our series has taken us now to the book of Ecclesiastes. And Ecclesiastes is part of a grouping of books that we're referring to as the poetic books. There are five of them, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. Um, Of these five books, uh, three of them were written by Solomon. Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and whose song? Solomon's song. And these poetic books find their setting somewhere in the first 17 books of the Bible, the narrative section. And since Solomon is the writer of Ecclesiastes. We know that the setting for it is the first 11 chapters of 1 Kings. That tells his story. And uh, 1 Kings kind of gives us information regarding the reign of Solomon, while Ecclesiastes gives us insight into the life of Solomon. In other words, this book is going to tell us about Solomon's life from Solomon's perspective. And so we have the the narrator of the kings giving us the historical record of Solomon's life. And then we have here in Ecclesiastes, Solomon giving a poetic autobiography of his own life. I would actually appreciate if there were one more perspective of Solomon's life. I would like to read the perspective from some of the people whose lives were so negatively impacted by the behaviors of Solomon. I think that would be a a very valuable insight, and we might talk a touch about that tonight. Um, Ecclesiastes is the 21st book of the Old Testament. It It contains 12 chapters, 222 verses. It gets its name from the opening line. Let's take a look. Verse 1 reads, the words of the who? preacher. And the, Solomon originally wrote this work in Hebrew. It was later translated into Greek. There's a, the, that first major translative work of the scriptures into the Greek language called the Septuagint. And the word Ecclesiastes is a derivative of the word that's translated preacher. It's the Greek version of that. And it's a word that carries the idea of being a preacher or a teacher, a debater, an instructor. And the idea behind it is Solomon is telling us that he has a message in store for us. That, that this, this poetry that he writes this is uh, designed in order to instruct us and warn us of certain things. Um, Ecclesiastes has some very beautiful and memorable poetry within it. The third chapter is probably the most well-known of the book of Ecclesiastes. Um, Pop culture has made it popular. Uh, If you're over 40, you probably recognize the song that was playing during the break time, the birds singing, turn, turn, turn. The words from that come from Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Solomon is making observations about things in life that are measurable. They're predictable, and he's making these comments about them. Um, Chapter 4. In chapter 4, there's beautiful poetry where Solomon is observing human behavior, and Solomon just notices that life is better together. And he writes, two are better than one. And he goes on to give some very practical Reasons why two are better than one. If they lie down, they can keep each other warm. 
if they get jumped, they can fight somebody off. If they are uh, trying to get some work done, they can get more work done. And uh, for some reason, that's become a marriage passage. It's not really romantic, unless you're expecting to get jumped on your honeymoon. But, uh, but it is a beautiful sentiment, this idea that two are better than one. And then he talks about this threefold chord, and we'll mention that again at the end of the message. Um, Ecclesiastes is a sermon with a message that's extremely relevant for today. In short, the message of this book is that true life is found in relationship with God. Let me say that again. In short, the message of this book is that true life is found in relationship with God. Solomon is going to beat that into us through the book. And this is actually the central message of Scripture. We might say the primary message of Scripture is that life is found in relationship with God. The Bible teaches us that man was created to know God. That is our ultimate purpose, is to know God, to be in relationship with Him. The Bible teaches us that we can only find true fulfillment when we're in relationship with God. The Bible teaches us that it's Jesus who came into the world to make it possible for us to have that relationship with God. And so the invitation of Scripture is inviting you to, into a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. It's not just inviting you to, to participate in a club or a group of people that have a similar worldview or similar political standings. It's actually inviting you into a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, where you know God personally. The Bible tells us that when we were born, we were born, uh, we were, we were born with, into a body or with a body, and that we are a soul. The soul would speak of our intellect, of our emotion, of our desire, our will. But the Bible tells us that we need to be born again in order to come alive spiritually. And when we're born again, it's through the Spirit that we actually relate to God and have relationship with Him. And while the Spirit is often the neglected part of life, it is actually supposed to be the leading part of life. Your emotions, your intellect, your body drives, those are not the things that God created to put behind the steering wheel of your life. That's not what's supposed to drive you. You're supposed to be led by the Spirit of God in relationship with God. And Solomon's journey is going to lead him to that conclusion. I love the way John put it, 1 John chapter 5, John puts it this way. He says, he who has who? The Son has what? Life. So if you have the Son, you have what? Life. And then he says, conversely, he who does not have who? Does not have what? Life. Is that pretty straightforward? I mean, there are no doubt there are passages of Scripture that are complicated and difficult to understand. Is this one of them? No. If you, are, if you have received Jesus Christ, there's life associated with that. If you've yet to surrender to Jesus Christ, you're missing out on the life that God intends for you. Now, Ecclesiastes was written by Solomon. Um, uh, Hebrew tradition tells us that Solomon wrote the Song of Solomon in his youth. He wrote the Proverbs throughout his life. It was something that over time, as he, remember last week we talked about him being a student of human behavior, and as he, he just watched people behave a certain way, and he wrote something out, okay? I like the one, I think I referred to it this weekend. If you want to have friends, you have to be what? Friendly. So Solomon just watched. He watched mean people that didn't have any friends. And he watched nice people that had friends. And he thought, I guess if you want to have friends, you should be nice. And he wrote a proverb about it, right? But he, he, he cataloged these things over time. Ecclesiastes is written at the end of his life. Solomon is, is looking back. And, and unfortunately, Solomon is looking back with a lot of regret because Solomon spent much of his life walking down the, the wrong roads. Now, although the book is not specifically signed by Solomon, he doesn't say the song that is Solomon's, like he'll do in the next book. But listen to how he describes himself. Again, verse 1. The words of the preacher, the son of who? 
David, king where? In Jerusalem. Jump over to verse 12. I, the preacher, was king over what? Where? In Jerusalem. Now, there is only one son of David who sat as king over Israel in Jerusalem. There's only one son. That's Solomon. The, the remainder of David's descendants ruled over Judah from Jerusalem, but only Solomon ruled over all of Israel. So Solomon alone fits the description of verses 1 and verse 12. Also, Solomon fits the man described in the book of Ecclesiastes. He's described as a man of unparalleled wisdom. And we know in 1 Kings chapter 4 that that was a character trait of Solomon. He's described as a man of great wealth. In 1 Kings chapter 10, Solomon is described as a man of excessive wealth, and he's described as a man of extensive building projects in Ecclesiastes, and we know that that is the mark that Solomon left behind him in the nation. Solomon is most famous for building what? The temple. But he also built numerous other, um, or was involved in numerous other building projects. Some of you who've been to Israel, you remember going to Tel Megiddo? And on Tel Megiddo, you actually see the remains of what were Solomon's stables. And so Solomon was an extensive builder, just as it's described. This is an autobiographical work. It, it sums up Solomon's pursuits. It's written more like a sermon or a poetic diary than it is a biography. If you're looking for time stamps and dates and, dis and directions and real clear laid out Western thought, you won't find it here. It's written more in the form of poetry. Its message is somewhat hidden to us in this Eastern poetic style. So the more familiar you become with the style of writing, the easier it is for you to recognize the message. Now, I think there are three keys that if we hold on to these keys when we step into the book of Ecclesiastes, it's going to help us unlock meaning. So I'm going to give you those three keys. Here's key number one. Key number one is this entire book builds towards a final conclusion. Let me say that again. The entire book builds towards a final conclusion. No, no part of the book can be understood if it's divorced from the final conclusion. It's, it's a, Solomon's taking us on a journey. He's taking us somewhere. And we're not there till the end of the book. It's like if, you were, if you're traveling, if you're going to go across the state, you're going to watch the, the Tampa Bay Rays play baseball. So you're going to drive across Route 60 to St. Pete. But you decide to stop in Yeehaw Junction. And at Yeehaw Junction, you decide to go into Stuckey's. And you go into Stuckey's because you're thirsty, so you get, a, you get a soda the size of a five-gallon bucket. You get a bag of chips. You decide it's a good idea to also buy an alligator head and a Florida magnet for the refrigerator. I mean, just whatever, like what's in. But you don't, you don't think, well, I guess we're here. We've made it, right? You're en route. This is, this is just, this is a stop along the way. The destination is somewhere else. This book is leading us to a final conclusion. Here's the conclusion. Chapter 12, verse 13, reads this way. Let us hear the what? How do we know this is the conclusion? How, like, like, Jim, how do you figure these things out? They're, they're so mysterious to me. When I, when I read my Bible, I just don't understand it. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Okay, Solomon's telling us the conclusion. Here's his conclusion. Fear God and keep his commandments. Now, we talked extensively about what the fear of God was when we were in the book of Proverbs. Fearing God is seeking to live a life that is well-pleasing to God. I want to do what is pleasing to God. Here's what he says. Here's the conclusion. Live your life in a way that is pleasing to God. Do what his word says. Live within the lanes the Bible creates for you. That's Solomon's plea. And then he goes on to tell us really why. He says in the next verse, for God will bring every work into what? 
including every secret thing, whether good or evil. He says, one day, this life's going to come to an end. This life's going to be over. And one day, we're all going to stand before God in judgment for this life. So he's pleading with us. He's saying, here's the conclusion. You don't have to learn this the hard way like I did. You can learn it from me. Fear God. Keep his commandments. Um, Unfortunately, Solomon will spend a lot of his time pursuing something other than that conclusion. And the things that he's pursuing, he's searching for life, and the things that he's pursuing are actually robbing him of the life that God intends for him. So God has, a, has life for him. Remember the, the central message of the Bible, the central message of this book is that life is found in relationship with God. But Solomon is going to search for life outside of that, and he's going to be robbing himself of the very life that God intended. Listen to what Jesus said in Matthew 16. Jesus said, whoever desires to save his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Jesus says, the secret to finding life is not running from me in search of something else. The secret to finding life is is pursuing me, walking in relationship with me. So the key to this book is it all builds toward the conclusion. Here's the second key. The second key to this this book is found in verse 3. Take a look, chapter 1, verse 3. Solomon writes, What profit has man from all his labor in which he toils where? Under the sun. Now, this is an interesting statement. He, he actually uses it 29 times in the book. So over and over again, Solomon will use the phrase, under the sun. And this phrase helps us unlock the meaning behind the book. Solomon's pursuits are all, are all made under the sun. In other words, he's viewing life from a purely natural perspective. He's he's not viewing life from a heavenly perspective. He's not allowing a higher moral value to guide him. He's not allowing special revelation, in other words, the word of God to speak into his life. He's, He's giving no real notion of God. He will mention God several times in the book, but it's very interesting. When he uses the term for God, he uses a very general, or we might say generic term for God. He never uses the covenant name for God in the book. He, in, a, in a sense, he refers to God the same way a celebrity might refer to God. When they're standing, they're, they're being awarded for some activity. Maybe they played a role in a movie, and maybe that role was something that... that um, that illustrated things that are totally opposed to the value system of God, but they're being awarded for it. They come up to the stage and they stand before and they just say, oh, I just want to thank God. And I think, really, did you see your movie? I'm not sure God was super stoked on it. Hey? Or, or, or you have a politician. And a politician who is, who's, who's standing upon a platform that is opposed to the values of God. He's pushing forward things that are opposed to what the Bible teaches us. And then you'll stand before the people and they'll say, well, God bless you or God bless America. And it's a very generic way of using the term God. That's how Solomon speaks of God in this, in this book. He doesn't speak of God in relationship with him. And so the idea that here's a man who's traveling through life without considering what heaven has to say to his life, not considering relationship with God or what would please God. He's trying to navigate through life without that. A book about that is very relevant in every culture, isn't it? And it's particularly relevant today as so many are attempting to navigate their way through life without being connected to God. Solomon's search is limited to the natural. He fails to see that he's been created in the image of God and that he's been created for relationship 
with God, and so his navigation gets off track. This is the story of a natural man trying to find meaning in life apart from God. His views on life, his views on values or morality or happiness or death or eternity, they're determined by ignoring the word of God and just looking at life from an earthly perspective. Listen to what a man named William McDonald said. He said, at one time in his life, Solomon set out to find the true meaning of human existence. He was determined to discover the good life. But there was a self-imposed condition in his search. He would do it on his own. He would search under the sun for the greatest good in life. In other words, I'm going to go find the good life, but I'm not interested in what you have to say, God, about what the good life is. I'm going to do it my own way. And that's how he pursued life. And as a result, Solomon touches on many of the philosophical viewpoints that have, that have worked their way into Western culture. Things like nihilism. Now, Solomon never uses that phrase, nor do most people that you communicate with. Most people that you see their post on, a, on social media or, or hear a speech that they give. But nihilism is the basic idea that there, are, there is no absolute truth. There's no standard of right and wrong. There's no real meaning to life except the meaning that you give to life. The, the nihilist might use the phrase, my truth. Perhaps you've heard that. That's become very popular in our culture today. Well, you know, this is just my truth. And I think to myself, is somehow your truth different than the truth? But if you have no absolute moral standard, and Solomon's going to touch on that. He's going he's to go down that road. There are times you read this, you go, Solomon, you sound exactly like that guy. Solomon will deal with stoicism. Stoicism is the idea that morals are absolutely critical to self-development and to the development of, cult, of society and culture. And that, that, that this idea that we have to live by a higher moral standard, but it stops without ever recognizing the need for relationship with God. And so the Stoic would be the person who would look at the modern culture and would be upset at modern culture and, would, and, and you know, looking at, at so much that's going on and just saying, this is crazy and what is happening, but without ever turning to realize that the primary need that the world has is to hear the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ and enter into relationship with him. Solomon will touch on Epicureanism or its wicked sister hedonism, which is the idea that pleasure is the ultimate goal. I'm just gonna live for whatever makes me happy. We, that's something that's definitely permeated its way into our culture. It, it shows itself in, in one, of the most, one of the most popular modern phrases, follow your heart. What does that mean? Just do whatever makes you happy. You've, you've, you've all received that counsel, haven't you? Somebody's actually told you, well, just follow your heart. Do whatever makes you happy. I had someone who was a doctor in psychology tell me that if I wanted to make a good decision, I should just follow my heart. And I thought, you don't know my heart. <laughs> my, I believe Jeremiah. He said the heart's deceitful. He said the heart can trick you. He said the heart can lead you into things that, that are destructive to you. And yet this, this idea of, well, my own pleasure, my own happiness is the highest. Perhaps the, the most common philosophy Solomon will live by and that permeates our culture is this, the, the philosophy of self. Self. It's the idea of putting my own personal needs or desires or ambitions above anything else. You just, you just do you. you know, it's, it, it's, I need a little me time. This is for me, enough, enough of the haters. It's time for some, and, and, it, and this idea of just, this, this philosophy is the driving force behind broken marriages, broken families, and broken cultures. People that put their own needs and desires and ambitions above anything else. Solomon's gonna walk all these roads. 
So when we look at the book of Ecclesiastes, it's like, this book is 2,900 years old, and, and none of the philosophies that, that, have, uh, that have made their way into modern culture are new. Solomon already walked this road. Solomon had, had the highest wisdom. He had unlimited resources, and he lived a pretty long life. And so he's already walked this road. You don't have to. He learned the hard way so that he could teach us not to. Here's the final key to understanding the book, and that is found in verse 2. Take a look at verse 2 and see if you can pinpoint what might be a key word from verse 2. Vanities of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What do you think Solomon's trying to say about life? What's he trying to say? It's vain. Now, we use the word vain to speak about someone who is conceited, right? Do you remember the song, You're So Vain? You probably what? Think the song's about you, right? It's just like such a great line. Um, but Solomon uses this word differently. The, the word here is a word that means like a breath or like a vapor. It's something that just passes. It's, it's here and it's gone. It's like if when you, those rare cold mornings here, in Florida, praise God, and uh, where you, you breathe and see your breath and then it's gone. That's what he's saying. He's saying life is like that. It's fleeting. It's temporal. It's unsatisfying. This, this is the conclusion that Solomon's going to come to of what life is like apart from God. He actually uses this term vanity 39 times in the book. 39 times. He says, this is vain. This is vain. He, he'll have some specifics. He talks about the vanity of human wisdom, the vanity of human labor, the vanity of living a life of excess, the vanity of fame, the vanity of riches, the vanity of coveting. And then in chapter 1, verse 14, listen to what he says. I have seen all the works that are done under the sun, and indeed, what? All, how much? According to Solomon, how much? All is vanity and grasping at the wind. He says, I've gone after these things and they don't satisfy. Now, now listen, listen. Solomon is not saying, I went after pleasure and I went after riches and I went after fame and I went after you know, success and I just couldn't get it. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, I got the riches and I got all the pleasure and I got all the fame, and I had all the success, and it's empty. He's saying, listen, I followed the rainbow. I grabbed that leprechaun by his neck. I got a hold of the pot of gold. I swam in it, okay? It didn't elude me. I had it all, but it just didn't satisfy. It's empty. Um, he found that this had actually, this pursuit had actually uh, made him a confused and angry, bitter and pessimistic man. The, the man that you, as you read through Ecclesiastes, you read about this guy, you think, I don't think I like this guy very much. He says, you know, the only, he doesn't use this exact terminology, but he essentially says this, you know, the only thing worse than being alive is dying. But you know what would even be better than that? If you never lived at all. Hey, you want to have coffee? I don't want to hang out with that guy. Solomon truly. Remember the verse we saw earlier? Matthew 16, 25. Whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. That was Solomon. He, he, he got the pot of gold. He got everything he was pursuing. And he missed out on life. Now, why study Ecclesiastes? Um, Solomon's purpose is to convince us of the uselessness of pursuing life apart from God. We might say that this, though, is a means to a much bigger end. He's not just trying to tell us of the usefulness of life apart from God. He's actually telling us that the ultimate goal is that we be in relationship with God. Listen to what he says in Ecclesiastes 12 at verse 1. 
This is as he's working towards his final conclusion. He says this, remember now your creator. When? In the days of your youth, before the difficult days come. He, Solomon, in a sense, is saying, I learned this stuff the hard way, and I'm trying to help you not learn it this way. You know, um, uh, Pastor Nick shared a couple weeks ago on Sunday morning, and, uh, and he said, I'm going to give away for free some things that cost me a lot. That's what Solomon's doing. It's like, this is free. Cost you nothing. Take some time, read it. Cost you nothing, but it cost Solomon his life. He learned this stuff walking the hard road, and what he found is that life is found in relationship with God. He's not alone in these findings. Listen to what Blaise Pascal said. He was a 17th century philosopher. He said, there is a God-shaped void in the human heart. He says, nothing else will satisfy you but God. Uh, Augustine, who is an early Christian theologian, said this, you have made us, O Lord, for yourself, and our heart will find no rest until it rests in you. Uh, C.S. Lewis said this, I find in myself a desire, I'm sorry, if I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. Listen, you went down all the roads and got the pots, swam in the gold, wrestled the leprechaun, and didn't find, it's because there's something in you, you were created by God for relationship with him. Paul put it this way, Colossians 2, he said, we are complete in Christ, who is the head of all principality and power. Isaiah put it this way in Isaiah 58, he said, the Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your soul in drought and strengthen your bones. You shall be like a watered garden and like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. This was uh, this idea of finding life and relationship with God is one of the common themes in the messages of Jesus. Listen to what he said in John 15, this famous parable comparing himself to the vine and us the branches. Jesus says, I am the what? The what? What kind of vine? Which implies there's false vines. What Jesus is saying in the parable of the, of the vine and the branches, he is saying, life is found in me. But he's warning. He's warning there's a lot of stuff that's going to say, come here and you'll get life. You, you want to add something? You want to spice up your life? You want to make it more enjoyable? You want to have something better? Leave God and pursue this. You know, there's an interesting story. It's in 1 it's in, uh, Kings. Uh, and it is after the time, actually it's in Second Kings, it's after the time of Solomon. Uh, but there was a school of prophets, it's like a school of ministry. And they, the, these students apparently had responsibilities of sharing, cooking, and cleaning responsibilities. So there was one student that was making stew. And uh, some other student tastes the stew and says, this stew is terrible. And so he goes out into the woods and he finds a vine and growing on this vine are these wild gourds. And he brings those back and he slices them up and he throws them in the stew and they stir it up and he tastes it. He goes, now nah, that's a good stew. And then they serve it. And the guys are sitting down and they're eating and one of the guys sees the gourd floating in it. He happens to know a little bit more than the other student. He says, there's death in the pot. This guy found a gourd that would give flavor to the stew, it was a poisonous gourd, it was gonna kill everyone at the table. Okay, it's a, it's a miracle that they were saved. But listen, that's what life is often like. Jesus is life, life is found in him, but there's all these voices saying, come over here and taste this. Come over here and be involved in this. And that very thing will not add spice to your life, that very thing is putting death in the pot. The, um, Jesus said this, speaking to the woman at the well, John 4, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I give him will never thirst, but the water I give will become a fountain of water springing up to everlasting life. Now, you don't even have to know what that means to think, I want that, right? I don't, I, Jesus, you're speaking a whole lot of figurative language that I don't necessarily get, but I know living water is better than still water. 
and I know a fountain of it is awesome. And so whatever that is, Jesus, give it to me. A little later in John chapter 7, during the Feast of Tabernacles, they had this, this celebration at the Feast of Tabernacles where from the, the corner of the temple, they would send a runner down to the Pool of Siloam and he would bring water up from the temple and then they would pour the water out. And it was symbolic. The Feast of Tabernacles was remembering the wilderness journey. And that was symbolic of how God had provided water for the children of Israel as they wandered through the wilderness. And so each day they would send a runner down. And the final day, as the celebration built, and they're getting ready to pour this water out as a, as a testimony, and it was a custom. And you know, if you've ever been in, in, a, in a setting that's very traditional, you, and you've been in several times to it, you know exactly what's coming next, right? They did this, oh, watch, 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 here's what comes next. Okay, now they're gonna do this. And on this particular feast, it was interrupted. It was interrupted because Jesus stood up and he cried out with a loud voice. He interrupted. Just imagine being in this setting. You're having the teaching. It's getting close to the time that's gonna end. You're starting to get a little fidgety. You're wondering if we're gonna go over or not. And then all of a sudden, somebody stands up and just yells, rah, 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 right? All the attention goes over to there. What are you doing? Is that guy crazy? Or is he just as bored as the rest of us? And, you know, all, right? All the attention goes to that. So Jesus stands up and he bellows. And this is what he says, John 7, 38, 37 and 38. The last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me out of this, out, as the scripture says, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Jesus stands up and gives an invitation. He says, life is found in relationship with me. If you want that life, just come to me. Here's an interesting thing. In addition to them going down and getting the water and pouring it out, um, there's um, some scholars tell us that it was during this same feast that they would read the book of Ecclesiastes. The, the, hey, the, we're, we're, we're the symbol of the fact that there's life found in God. There's the, he's going to provide it. We're reading the book of Ecclesiastes that's saying there's no life anywhere else. And then Jesus stands up and says, if you want that life that God offers, all you have to do is come to me. Come to me and you'll find it. Last thing we'll do, and this will be re really quick, an outline of Ecclesiastes. So if you're going to read through it uh, more carefully on your own, here's the outline. Uh, chapter one, verses one through three is an introduction. Okay, Solomon introduces himself. He tells us how vain and empty life is. He tells us it's vain and empty because he's looking at it from the perspective of under the sun. Chapter 12, verse 13 and 14, Solomon comes to his conclusion. He says, here's the conclusion. You should fear God and you should keep his commandments because we're all gonna stand before him. And in between is Solomon's journey. And Solomon's going to take a bunch of paths. Now, remember, he's searching for meaning of life apart from God. And he's going to find that there is no life apart from God. Um, his, the journey starts this way. Take a look over at chapter 1, verse 13. Look what he says. I set my heart to seek and search out wisdom concerning all that was done under heaven. This burdensome task God has given to the sons of men by which we may be exercised. So he goes, I'm in a search for wisdom. Verse 17, he says, I set my heart to know wisdom and madness and folly, and I perceived that this is all grasping at the wind. So I went after wisdom, and I got the pot of gold, and it didn't satisfy me. Chapter two, he says this, I said in my heart, come now, I'll test you with myrrh. Mirth, therefore enjoy pleasure. But this was also vain. Look at verse 10 of chapter two. Whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I did not withhold my heart from any pleasure for my heart rejoiced in all my labor. And this was the reward of my labor. He says, I went after pleasure and there were no restraints, none. The restraints that God puts on man, I didn't care about those. The restraints my own conscience puts on me, I didn't care about those. The restraints my culture put on me, I don't care about those. I went after pleasure with all the resources that I had. And guess what? Empty. He says in chapter 2, verse 4, he says, I made my works great. He wanted to make a name for himself. 
And in verse 11, he says, I looked at the works of my hands, all the labor that I had done, and it was vanity. It was grasping at the wind. John calls this the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. He says it's everything that the world has to offer. Solomon pursued all of it. Solomon got all of it. And Solomon was empty by all of it. Um, if you're going to read through the book, one last thing that I think will be helpful. Solomon makes several um, smaller conclusions along the way. He's not at the end of the journey yet. So he'll make statements that seem to be like a truism. He'll make a statement it seems that he's, he, he thinks is true, um, only to discover later that he was wrong. And has that ever happened to you in life? Have you ever thought something was true, only to find out later that that wasn't actually true? Um, there, in a sitcom, there's a character who said, when I was young, I thought chocolate milk came from brown cows. Okay? I, listen, I, true story. USA Today reported in 2017 that a survey was conducted of 100 people randomly on the street. I'm sorry, 1,000 people. 7% of them thought chocolate milk came from brown cows. Okay, okay. I'm pretty sure people need to work on their truth a little bit, okay? But here's the idea. Solomon, Solomon is going to, he's going to make some statements like chocolate milk comes from brown cows. And then he's going to go farther down. He's going to go, oh, no, that actually isn't. So how, how do we work our way through this book? Two things. First Thessalonians 5 says this, test all things and hold, for, hold fast to what is good. So when you read something Solomon says, stop and test it. Well, how do I test it? Acts chapter 17 says that these were more fair-minded in those in Thessaloniki in that they received the word of God with readiness and searched where? The scriptures to find out if they were so. Let's look at one of these examples. Chapter 7, verse 16. 7, 16 says this. Here's Solomon. Do not be overly righteous nor overly wise. Why should you destroy yourself? Solomon saying, hey, listen, don't be fanatical in your relationship with God. Settle down a little bit, okay? This comes from a man who sits on an ivory throne that's covered in gold. Does it matter what your throne is made of if you cover it in gold? He's sitting on an ivory throne covered in gold. Around him are ivory stone lions and 12 living lions. Climbing around him are monkeys and apes. Behind him is a harem of 700 wives and 300 concubines. In front of him are building projects that he's taxed the nation almost to death in order to accomplish, and this man is telling us not to be excessive. Okay? I would say Solomon is not someone you want to listen to. I think listening to Paul is better. Paul said this, I beseech you, therefore, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable God, to God, and don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So here's an example of Solomon making a statement. He thinks it's true. Bro, brown cows don't make chocolate milk. You're not right here. 